Yes, sure. So, uh, I think first, yeah, if you could please, um, if the speakers could mute themselves for this uh, first minutes. Thank you. Okay, so we are there. We wait a few minutes for more people to join. We have already uh, uh, 60 people uh, between uh, speakers and participants. So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Have a good Data Protection Day 2022. Uh, I'm very happy that we can celebrate Data Protection Day today with this stellar, hugely stellar panel of uh, speakers on this topic that is so uh, dear to me, but uh, I'm not, uh, you know, it's not uh, my party. So I will just introduce, say hi on behalf of the Brussels Privacy Hub, also um, on behalf of my, um, uh, of the other co-director of the Brussels Privacy Hub. I'm Giancarlo De Margeri, Associate Professor of Law and Technology at the DECO Business School, co-director of the Hub together with Chris Kuhner. I just wanted to say thank you to our program and uh, dissemination coordinator, uh, Vincenzo Tiani, who is helping us in this event series on uh, artificial intelligence and the AI Act and also to our um, managing director, Mohamed Demirjan, um, who is helping us every day. Uh, now I just uh, <coughs> uh, will leave uh, uh, the, the floor to, um, to the moderator, just a few words about uh, today. So um, today is an event co-organized with uh, LEADS, uh, Legality Attentive Data Science, a Marie Curie Horizon uh, project. Uh, bridging the gap between law and data science, uh, um, incredible um, a partnership uh, of, of, of um, different entities, so, so maybe you can see on the website. Um, and we have here the principal investigator of the project uh, who will be moderator today, Professor Giovanni Comande, full professor of comparative law at Sant'Anna School of Advanced Studies in Pisa. He will introduce the other uh, member of the panel. And our members and uh, yeah, just just to, to to launch about the topic of today, I would like to say one provocation and then I will mute and I will close my camera. Uh, basically, we uh, you know, Data Protection Day is an occasion to reflect on the data protection in the, in the last at least forty years. We had I think three generations of data management uh, in the digital world, right? We went from opacity to black box, dark patterns to an age of transparency, consent and safeguard. I think now we are looking at the third era. Third era is more than transparency, it's justification, it's more than explanation, it's uh, um, accountability and algorithmic impact assessment and fairness and so on. Artificial Intelligence Act is the next step. Uh, we have this new council version of January the 13th in which Article 13 about explainable AI is a bit rephrased. Uh, it's not just interpretable, it's understandable. How this change of wording uh, is, is, is relevant, we will see for the discussion. I will uh, put in the chat a couple of papers that in the last uh, uh, weeks or months uh, we have been uh, writing on the topic and now I will leave the floor to Giovanni to introduce our, our uh, panelists and thank you all again for, for being here. Thank you very much Gian Claudio, thank you very much for uh, spending a lot of my time with all the, the thanking to the organization that I uh, fully share, we agreed on that, and a special thanks especially to Amad who is actually managing right now uh, all the incoming um, issues. Uh, Legality Attentive Data Scientist, it's a Marie Curie uh, Horizon 2020 project, as uh, Gian Claudio was saying, it's trying to bridge uh, gaps among different uh, cultures, not only legal cultures, but expertise. And this is uh, one of our awareness conferences, maybe the most important of the year, uh, because it's uh, devoted to a, uh, a dear issue, personal data protection in its celebration uh, day. We have chosen uh, for this awareness conference uh, the, the topic of interplay with explainability of AI. 
but before going for a, one moment into it, let me thank our uh, dear and uh, stellar, as Jean Claudio was saying, uh, speaker. We are uh, honored to have all of uh, you here uh, with us. And uh, just for the sake of time, which is a, a time, um, I will uh, uh, very quickly uh, introduce all of you now so that we can smoothly move from uh, one speaker to uh, to another, and I can also concentrate on the uh, questions in uh, in in the chat. Uh, I will introduce uh, them in the order. I will uh, be inviting them uh, to to speak so that also the audience is aware of uh, of it. So my first thank goes to uh, Daphna Feinholz uh, from uh, uh, UNESCO. Uh, she is uh, chief of the Bioethics and Ethics of Science and Technology uh, in the Division of uh, Youth Ethics and, and Sport. Uh, uh, her role, and I think she has also some uh, slides to share with us, it's, it's key because UNESCO uh, document is the first real international uh, document giving a perspective with a lot of, I think, very insightful thoughts. Uh, I just quote, so I will just use this as an introduction, the idea of uh, um, referring to not only uh, the traditional uh, speakers and interveners, but talking about AI actors, which is opening uh, in, from the good uh, perspective, a Pandora box of um, engagement. And, and also I really look forward to your presentation, Daphne, as well. But we have also the honor and pleasure to have with us Paul Nemitz, who is Principal Advisor in the Director General for Justice and Consumers and AI of the European Commission. So it's, it's an institutional, very wide perspective that we'll be having. So thank you very much, Paul, for joining us. Uh, our uh, uh, stellar panel continue with the Kathleen Mueller, who is uh, uh, representing not only as president of Ally, uh, and the independent organization promoting responsible AI, but giving voice to this other uh, large area of stake ownership. So thank you very much, Kathleen, for joining. Um, to continue also with the provocation, uh, Ricardo Masucci, who is the Global Director of the Privacy Policy uh, at Intel, and it's also leading the Intel's Global Advocacy on Privacy Legislation, is active on cybersecurity as well, will bring the, uh, the stakeholders perspective of the, of the companies, if you want. And uh, one, one other layer of provocation in with explainability is, well, for whom we should uh, have explainability. The, the whole idea, today is Personal Data Protection Day, and we, we will be concentrating on fundamental rights for sure, but uh, my understanding and provocation is that we have to protect fundamental rights, the fundamental rights to privacy and, and personal data protection, also for the sake of uh, the businesses. And I will, uh, I will uh, shoot probably a provocation later on because if uh, the wrong data in the wrong way are processed, we are just wasting as well economic resources. Last but absolutely not <laughs> least, it's uh, uh, Fosca uh, Giannotti, a prominent researcher and friend as well, uh, who is director of the um, co-director of the KDD lab in, in Pisa. She uh, also chair at uh, Scuola Normale uh, Superior in, uh, in Pisa, but which is actually the first chair in informatics ever for the normal that has been uh, allocated to her. She is also director at National Council of Research. Um, I'm closing with Fosca uh, for a number of reasons, uh, including the fact that she is leading a European research um, grant on explainability of AI. So her perspective as a scientist is really deep in it. But I won't spare more of, of, of your time. I will um, profit on my position to give provocation as well. And I immediately give the floor to uh, Daphna Feynolds for a, a first round uh, table. Thank you, Daphna. Please, you have the floor. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, for this uh, kind invitation and uh, to participate in this panel that uh, 
not only promised to be provocative, but very interesting and insightful. And I hope I can uh, I can contribute, but also I'm sure I'm going to learn as well. So let me uh, just prepare this. Um, and for the audience, as already the speakers know, I will be very, very strict in the timing so that we have time for the discussion. So 10 minutes, I will notify to you when you are basically two minutes uh, away from your 10 minutes. Please do. Uh, and I'm trying to I'm trying to look for my to see how can I share my presentation? I am not sure I'm successful. I am. Am I? Yes. Yes. What? Yes. Okay. You Thanks. can see it now. Yep, perfectly. Thank oh, you. Great, great, even better. OK, so again, uh, a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, well, as we know, AI offers an unprecedented potential to help us tackling very complex challenges from alleviating poverty to improving healthcare and promoting sustainable development. COVID-19 pandemic increases the use of these technologies, particularly AI, and generated some of the earliest alerts about the COVID-19 outbreak and helped accelerate the discovery of the vaccines. But these AI technologies developed and applied without ethical guardrails rails, can also deepen inequalities and infringe upon human rights. Uh, thus, uh, while AI-powered tracking and tracing apps, which is also related to data protections, have been widely utilized to help contain the pandemic, but they have also implications for privacy and data protection and may be abused for massive surveillance in the absence of safeguards. Artificial intelligence can be misused for malicious purposes, but it also increasingly being used for public and private entities to inform decisions across all domains of life, from credit scoring to job, job recruitment and decision regarding judicial outcomes. AI methods currently used uh, are mainly based on data. Therefore, development of AI systems depend on what kind of data is used. That data can be incomplete. It can include societal biases or stereotypes, which can have uh, far reaching consequences. And AI systems can also lack transparency and explainability, which was one of the main topics of today. Further, it is well known that regulations are often behind market developments, but in the case of AI, it is even more so. For example, we still lack clear rules on how to attribute responsibility and ensure accountability therein. Indeed, systems that learn from information they receive from the outside world can act in ways that their creators could not have predicted, while predictability is crucial to modern legal approaches. Such systems can operate independently for their creators or operators, which complicates the task of determining responsibility. These characteristics posit problems related to predictability and, and the ability to act independently, while at the same time uh, not being li liable. These issues are at the core of the discussions in many countries, but the way to deal with them merit international cooperation. These are some of the reasons why so many countries and regional organizations have been attempting to come with frameworks that ensure ethical development and use of artificial intelligence systems. This is also why UNESCO has come with this, as you just mentioned at the beginning, the first and unique global framework that provides such guidance. After months of constructive dialogue and negotiation, tough, member states have adopted the recommendation of ethics of artificial intelligence last November, which is an ambitious and wide ranging new template for ethical development of deployment of artificial intelligence. And as you said, it includes um, the whole life cycle of, uh, of, uh, of AI. It's uh, from the risk from the design and, and and research and application and also when deployment and also when to decide when to stop it. And as you also mentioned, also the all AI actors, meaning uh, all the legal and natural persons uh, that are involved through the whole life cycle, meaning researchers, engineering, data scientists, end users, etc. As the first global normative instrument in this field, the recommendation of ethics of AI is a novel anticipatory and transformative framework offering concrete policy actions that are anchored in universal values and principles. 
to ensure that AI systems work for the good of humanity. And uh, some, something very important is that includes the Global South because it's one of the main uh, the global global ones and uh, i think it is important i will mention later uh, because very related to our topic today is uh, the very specific area of data protection or the the chapter on data because it goes from principles and values to concrete policy areas so this recommendation is a blueprint for global consensus on, on the what as well as the how of the ethical regulation of this game-changing technology and serves as a shared reference point for leaders around the world on how to control the risk and harness these new technologies as a force for good. Therefore, the recommendation calls for principles such as transparency, accountability and human oversight to ensure that AI remains within the control of humans and also provides specific definitions and concrete policy actions to address these challenges. Greater transparency contributes to more peaceful, just and democratic and inclusive societies. It allows for public scrutiny that can decrease corruption and discrimination and can also help detect and prevent negative impacts of human rights. Transparency aims at providing appropriate information to address this to enable their understanding of the technology and foster trust. Nevertheless, it is true that explainability is not always possible yet, and explainability itself can be problematic, for example, personal data protection. Therefore, where efforts need to be made to increase transparency and explainability of AI systems, the level of transparency and explainability should always be appropriate to the context and impact as there may be a need to balance between transparency and explainability and on the other and on the other principles such as privacy, safety and security. In any event, people should be fully informed when a decision is made on the basis of AI algorithms and should have the opportunity to request explanatory information. In addition, individuals should be able to access the reasons for a decision affecting their rights and freedoms, and there have to be in place redressal mechanisms in case there is any uh, harm caused, caused to them. Explainability refers to making intelligent, intelligible and providing insights into the outcomes of AI systems. AI actors uh, in the broad sense I, that I just described, should commit to ensuring that the algorithms developed are explainable. In the case of AI applications that impact the end user and in a way that is not temporary, is irreversible or otherwise low risk, it should be ensured that the meaningful explanation is provided with any decision that results in the action taken in order for the outcome to be considered transparent. Transparency and explainability relate closely to adequate responsibility and accountability measures, as well as to the trustworthiness of AI system. And as I said in the data protection uh, policy, we have, uh, the, the, we have the obligation for member states to develop these frameworks uh, that allow access and control uh, of the information by the users that they can decide also when to delete their information. It addresses the, the need to have quality, uh, uh, quality in the training of data and algorithms and, and other, among other things. The recommendation also proposes the, the development of two innovative tools to help with the practical implementation of these principles and related policy actions. The first tool is an ethical impact assessment, which aims to help member states and other stakeholders to evaluate the benefits and risk of AI systems, put in place risk prevention, mitigation and monitoring measures, as well as deploy redress mechanisms for those who have been adversely affected by these new technologies, as I already mentioned. And the second tool is the readiness assessment methodology, which aims to assist member states in identifying the readiness status related to the recommendation, recognizing that member states are at different stage of readiness with respect to implementing this recommendation, not only from the technical and the legal perspective, but also from the social and cultural one. And lastly, uh, all this taken together is aimed at ensuring that respecting, protecting and promoting personal data protection and more generally fundamental rights, while at the same time, the idea is not to block the development and uptake of AI at all, but rather making sure that such developments and uptake beneficial 
to individuals and humanity by taking uh, the relevant concerns into account. Thank you so much. I hope I was in time. Perfect timing, nine minutes and 50 seconds. So it's really uh, excellent on, on all account. And thank you for this uh, perfect introduction, I think, to uh, Paul, uh, Paul Nemitz, because uh, the, the UNESCO uh, declaration, uh, draft the declaration, is basically sitting information and explainability uh, with the notion of AI actor in a much, much broader sense that we are used to, to see. Among other things, it's, it's rather clear that the principle of explainability and transparency under the UNESCO, as you suggested, it's basically asking, and now I quote, actors, AI actors, to inform users when a product or a service is provided directly or with the assistance of AI systems in a proper and timely manner. So I should be warned, for instance, uh, uh, that uh, my research results on uh, um, uh, are basically driven by AI systems uh, linked to profiling. Uh, and so that's a piece of information that is useful for me, but it should be useful also for the company that is paying after the real-time bidding to uh, display a, a specific kind of banner, right? Uh, they would need to know something more about how uh, they have been asked to pay more to display a specific banner on pink tennis shoes, for instance. So this goes very much to the, the interplay with the, the policy issues, and I think that's uh, exactly the field of Paul Nemitz. So you have the floor. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. I look forward to hearing. Thank you, Giovanni, <clears throat> and um, uh, um, thank you for uh, the introduction, but, but also the invitation to this very important uh, event. Let me say that um, legally attentive uh, AI uh, sounds uh, great. It's in a very short sentence some um, important concepts, but um, one can also have uh, some questions to, to, to this title. And um, one of uh, the first questions here um, is for me um, the relationship between ethics and self-regulation on the one hand, codes of conduct and so on, and the law uh, as such. Um, in the field of artificial intelligence, uh, we have an astonishing uh, number of initiatives which are non-binding, but which are well meant, maybe, um, but certainly are used in the parliamentary process, certainly in the United States, but have also been used in Brussels uh, to fend off the law. The argument being, we are already having sufficient motivation through ethics and self-regulation. We don't need to be regulated by law. Um, so in that sense, I see um, the heading of today's seminar as documenting a progress which actually has taken place. Certainly in Brussels, the discourse has moved on from a discourse on ethics of AI, um, which I would say has been very much inspired and in many aspects also financed from the big technology companies in the United States. Um, um, in view of the situation in Washington, uh, you know, I always like to say there are two schools on uh, keeping it non-binding uh, and doing, you know, ethics and, and self-regulation. One is the cynical school in the tradition of neoliberals who just don't want to be bound by a binding law. And there are some companies uh, which actively have pursued this course um, with a lot of money. And uh, there is the other school, which is, uh, I would call, the good ruling school of desperation uh, in the United States, namely those who recognize that the U.S. Congress is not able to come up with legislation in many fields which are important for the digital, you know, whether horizontal data protection law or, for that matter, uh, you know, AI regulation. It's not going to happen, uh, very unlikely. And uh, therefore, they say, well, then at least we need some uh, ethical rules or self-regulation. So th those are the good willing. And these two schools, uh, you know, they go around the world. It's all in English. We all read English. Um, and uh, they're being evangelized. And uh, this was certainly also an effort in Brussels, which I would say has failed. And I think that's good. Why is that good? 
because democracy means that the important matters in society um, are dealt with by the parliamentary legislator. That's the principle of essentiality. And um, from a business point of view, also um, we cannot have a level playing field in a competition in the internal market, but also globally, if we don't have binding rules. If we leave everything to self-regulation and ethics, you know, some companies will commit uh, and some others uh, they will not. And that will be a problem for public interest, but also a problem for fair competition. So um, uh, this is why um, uh, uh, there was a very important turn to, uh, to this first element of legally attentive AI, namely recognizing that the Internet uh, and digital and including AI is not the independent cyberspace of John Perry Barlow, where, as John Perry Barlow wrote in his famous declaration of the independence of cyberspace, parliaments and governments have no legitimacy, but that it is a, a, a scope uh, in the scope of democratic shaping and that the primacy of democracy over technology and business is um, expressed through law, the law being the most noble instrument um, um, of democracy. And I say this here uh, in this forum very consciously, this emphasis on democracy and law also, because let's be clear about one thing. We cannot at the same time talk about a crisis of democracy in the United States, in Poland, in Hungary, you know, in many countries around the world, and at the same time talk down uh, the instruments of democracy, namely the law, the binding law, the law which is enforced by the power of uh, uh, the public power of uh, democracy and of the state um, as being, you know, problems, uh, costly, uh, obstacle to innovation, protectionist and so on. And I think this has dawned more and more on people. And so I'm happy that we have now reached a stage where you know, among many uh, and in a trans um, disciplinary fashion uh, and among many organizations at the table, public and private, international and so on, we can discuss about what is important here, namely the binding rules which frame how artificial intelligence is going to be produced and how we make sure together through laws which are enforceable against every Everyone and not repeat the downside experience we have made with the unregulated internet. And I think that is the ambition in Brussels. And now let me move on. What does it mean uh, to talk about legally attentive and AI more in detail? So the first thing to realize here is it's not, of course, the AI which as such uh, uh, um, uh, is necessary, the only systemic element which has to pay attention to the law, but it is the producers of the AI, AI, the users and those who put the AI on the market. So let's also be clear here, we are not giving up the concept of human or corporate, namely legal person responsibility for the technology. Google has tried in the famous Google Spain right to be forgotten case to evade the corporate responsibility by referring to the full automatization of the search and presentation of its uh, search results in the Google Spain case. And I would say this was the first case in which one of the GAFAM tried to separate itself, its responsibility from its technology. You know, that would be the dream world of capitalism. You know, we produce technology which is fully automated. We make profits with it, but we have no responsibility if something goes wrong. And uh, in that vein, I also see, you know, these very strange efforts to create uh, legal persons uh, only for AI. Um, this is certainly a path which we are not following. It doesn't solve any problems. We maintain the principle that uh, AI is a technology like any other. There's always a legal person or a natural person responsible for AI, thus legally attentive. I just say this here to be sure that the word legally attentive AI is not limited to another aspect, which is also important, namely that 
maybe we are able in the future to build attention to law into the program. I think you know this is one of the great questions and um, I would only go as far as this uh, for today in the law of our member states. Automation of public uh, policy, uh, public uh, authority decisions is allowed um, and in some member states already in a, uh, regulated in a very detailed way, namely requiring that there must be a specific legal base for such automation and that automation can only take place in areas where um, the state does not exercise discretion. So this is about, let's say, mechanical decisions, for example, based on figures in uh, taxation. One uh, legal discussion which is important is whether these legal bases, which have been created around 10 to 20 years ago, uh, and refer not to AI, they refer to automation, and have been created at a time when the idea of automation was a mechanical input-output relationship where you can always predict with the same input, you get the same output, whether these legal bases are sufficient to use, um, to allow the use of artificial intelligence in these processes. I think that is not the case because um, artificial intelligence use is not automation. It is exactly not 100% predictable and mechanical relationship between input and output, which can always be replicated. But it contains for mutating and it contains the element, uh, um, uh, the element of um, um, uh, uh, non-explainability, which I think means that we need a new specific legal base in public um, uh, authority use for AI. It cannot be used just on the basis of the old automation uh, empowerment clauses which allow public authorities to, to automate their processes. Let me close by saying that it would be a huge mistake only to look at the AI Act and its content when ascertaining which law is relevant for this legal attention of the producer, the user or the system itself. GDPR has already been mentioned. There, depending on the context, there will be many, many other laws. And I think the simple rule of thumb is nothing which would be forbidden for a person is legal if the machine does it. And all laws which would apply to a person carrying out this function uh, must be complied with by the AI system if it carries out this function, which uh, previously was carried out by a human. And I think that is the 360 degree scope of legal attention, which the users, the producers and the systems itself must perform in the future. And um, if AI becomes so important that it contains the rules even according to which we live, then of course the principle must also be that it complies with higher law. We must test AI like we test a law against all higher principles. And uh, this is what I've written down in my article of 2018 um, on uh, democracy um, and technology in, uh, in, the, in, cons uh, in the age of artificial intelligence and which I think was a, an important piece in turning the discussion from pure ethics to the law. So thank you very much for recognizing that the law is today at the center of the debate, not anymore just non-binding and uh, in the future the enforcement of this law and the good functioning of this law uh, and the compliance with this law uh, will be hopefully also at the center of our debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank and much, I am Paul. I'm pretty sure you are not alone in discussing the risk of sure ethics washing that we uh, somehow overcame in the last uh, few years. I mean, legally attentive data scientists actually uh, started to, to deal with these issues uh, since 2017, when uh, the GDPR was not even in force. So definitely there is a full alignment with the, with the notion of legality attentive. 
and indeed it's the perfect match for the for the first for the next uh, next uh, um, speaker in that sense because there is one thing in which I uh, very uh, humbly disagree with you, Paul, which is uh, which is not important. My disagreement is the last point, that is the the mere adherence with the full round of legal rules that would apply to humans would cover all the legality needs for an AI because um, AI uh, presents some other kind of issues and problems goes beyond what humans can do and since AI could do something that humans could not manage uh, probably there are other concerns that they kicks in and in that I was mentioning and I think we agree on that as well I mean that's uh, it's the time <laughs> The time uh, was tyrant on that, but uh, definitely in, in giving the floor to Kathleen Mueller uh, and linking to your concern on ethics washing, it's important to stress that uh, sometimes what is legal, not necessarily it's acceptable on ethical grounds. And this is the testing to higher principles that I think you were mentioning. But this is important to, to remember because, uh, um, I mean, the, the guidelines on trustworthy AI have three legs, and I, I took the, uh, your uh, assist to insert just a, a, a reference to a paper. The legal leg has not been fully developed uh, yet uh, for a number of reasons but needs to be taken into account because law sometimes can permit something that we cannot accept or cannot accept anymore. Uh, and AI is uh, uh, opening to many of these uh, uh, fields for good, I mean, not for bad. But that's, I think, the, 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 the point in which definitely we have to call in Kathleen Mueller to uh, take the floor uh, on, on these and on the issues. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Kathleen, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, well, uh, first of all, um, uh, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with both of you, uh, I think. Um, uh, I, I used to be a lawyer, so I have a strong legal background as well. Um, and uh, like Paul said, um, AI does not operate in a lawless world, and it never did. Uh, we have all these uh, we have the fundamental rights, but we also have labor laws and administrative laws and commercial uh, uh, legislation and so on. And for every domain, um, we should look at what kind of legislation is already out there that we need to um, that we need to deal with uh, when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, I was a member of the high level expert group on AI and it is for this reason that we have this, set up the three pillars of trustworthy AI um, and that uh, we made law the first pillar. Um, but on top of that, uh, we have also uh, included two other pillars. Those are the ethical alignment and the social technical robustness. And for the ethical alignment, you see that there's a lot of overlap, but for the ethical alignment, we took the fundamental rights as a basis, so the law. And that is where you can see uh, ethics as a, as a fundament, for example, and uh, um, uh, of the law. But it can also, uh, uh, like you said, Mr. Moderator, uh, if there is uh, something that is allowed by law, it might not be acceptable in an ethical sense. The ethics and the uh, ethical elements also provide the roof to help you um, understand the law interpret the law if it's if it's not uh, if it's not clear in certain circumstances balance different legal rules if you have to such as fundamental rights sometimes you would have to balance those uh, um, uh, explain uh, the law and decide whether even if it is legally possible whether you as a society find it ethically acceptable to use a certain system and then there's the third pillar and that is the um, uh, social technical robustness of an AI system, which basically looks at elements such as, is this a system that is disrupting our entire societal structure, for example? Is it a system that is um, um, uh, 
causing enormous job loss, for example. Um, but um, I wasn't here to talk about uh, to talk about the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. However, they are very close to my heart. Uh, but I want to say something about uh, uh, about uh, uh, two other things. First of all, uh, we. Uh, a lot of times we hear the discussion, don't regulate anything, it will stifle innovation. Don't, um, uh, even the ethics, in, in my country, the Netherlands, there are people that say, oh, all these ethics, uh, ethics guidelines, they are stifling innovation. First of all, I want to say they don't. They promote innovation, first and foremost, because they level the playing field. Uh, you know uh, when you're developing something that your competitor can do exactly the same things as you can do and cannot uh, do anything uh, different. So it, it, it gives you a legal certainty of what you, can, uh, what you can do. The second thing, and I think that the moderator also mentioned this, is that there are ample examples of crappy AI with negative outcomes that are detrimental to governments, but to companies as well. Uh, if you don't, if you put out something that is crappy, people will lose trust, the uptake will stall, commercial benefits will diminish. So there is a, a, a reason also for businesses to make sure that um, uh, the development of AI is trustworthy and in line with the law. And a question that I also often ask is, okay, if it is going to stifle innovation, what are you innovating now, honestly? The AI Act, if you look at it, at least raises the bar as to the quality of the AI innovations. It really raises the bar um, um, uh, towards better innovation. And it may be even push the companies to take the extra step and to develop something that is truly uh, uh, truly sustainable and worthwhile. Um, I also want to um, say something about um, um, uh, about the, the the capabilities of artificial intelligence. AI is not as as good as we think often think it is. It's not as capable as we often think it is. It can do a lot, but we should remember that it is most AI systems recognize patterns in huge amounts of data. That is what they do. They correlate these patterns. They have no idea if they if they recognize a cat in a picture. They have no idea what a cat is, that it is an animal that has four legs, that you uh, can feed it and, and, and can, can keep it as a pet. Um, they have no idea. So we should really be, be, be aware and remain aware of what AI can and cannot do. I also want to make a step towards... Um, uh, the, the topic of this, um, of this afternoon, which is explainability. Um, the, in the uh, high-level expert group, the ethics guidelines for trust with the AI, we decided to put in a requirement uh, of transparency. We talked a lot about that, and transparency has two elements. Uh, it has uh, the requirement holds um, the need to be clear and transparent about the fact that you are using artificial intelligence and the system itself should be explainable. So the outcomes, you should be able to explain the outcomes for yourself, for others, etc. Just to go back to the law, explainability oftentimes is already mandatory by law. A government institution that takes decisions on who should receive social benefits or not is legally obligated to explain the decision to the recipient, no matter if the decision is taken by a human, by a dice, by the underbelly, or by an AI system. A judge who issues a verdict is legally obligated to motivate that decision, no matter if that decision is made or supported by an AI system. If an employer wants to fire someone, is legally obligated to substantiate and motivate this decision, no matter if that decision is the result of some kind of AI productivity scoring system. Um, and as you see from these um, examples, that the largest burden of explainability lies with the person or the organization taking the decision rather than the recipient of it. And what we now begin to see, unfortunately, in the AI policy process is that this burden 
is shifting more and more to the recipient of the decision. Let me give an example. The EU Platform Directive, the Platform Worker Directive, holds a chapter on algorithmic management. Algorithmic management involves tools that track workers' activities, both on and offline. Think of eye tracking, the tracking of mouse movements, room noise, typing speed, walking speed, driving routes, etc. And it involves tools that, based on these and other inputs, take decisions about workers. So decisions about rostering, allocation of tasks, but also promotion and demotion, and even termination. And without asking the question how these activities are already regulated by labor laws, the Commission simply proposes to allow these systems as long as the employer is transparent about it and explains how they work, and gives uh, workers the opportunity to ask for an explanation of the decision. So this is a form of transparency and explanation of AI that shifts the burden of explainability towards the workers, rather than that it requires the employer to make sure that, a, that clear decision structures are in place. And another example is the, uh, the transparency and targeting of Political Advertising Act, a recent proposal by the Commission. This proposal also tries to deal with the potential negative effects of political micro-targeting and nudging. Um, and in the same spirit as the Platform Worker Directive, it allows political micro-targeting with the use of sensitive data if there is consent and if, alongside the ad, it is clearly stated how the targeting came about. And then you can think of information about specific groups that are targeted, the parameters used to determine who is targeted, the categories of per, uh, personal data for the targeting, uh, the amplification goals, the mechanism, the logic behind, uh, behind the targeting, the parameters, etc., etc. Even if this could be done for each and every micro-targeted message in a, in a practical way, it can simply not be done in a truly transparent manner. And what I mean by that, that it cannot be done in such a way that targeted people, you and I, truly understand why and how we have been targeted. Transparency is not a one-way street. It involves the party providing the information as well as the recipient of the information. And the latter, the recipient, needs to be able to familiarize him or herself with that information. And whether the recipient is able to do this depends on many things, on time, on interest, on education level, knowledge, attention. And these transparency measures, again, place the burden of deciding whether I am willing to be micro-targeted now entirely on me. Irrespective if I have the time, the interest, the education level, the knowledge or the attention, to be able to understand what is happening. I can assure you that this is not what the high-level expert group had in mind when formulating the requirement of transparency and explainability. And it seems a bit like a, like a band-aid approach that the Commission is now choosing of providing ever more information and asking for consent um, is not enough to make sure that the fundamental rights that can be impacted are truly protected. And with this is so, what the, yes, I have to finish. Yeah, you are, you are a little bit over your 10 minutes, but if you can take a few I seconds. Hope I've made, I, I'm almost there. I hope I made my, I made my point, uh, point clear. The only thing I want to say is that we should not forget to keep on looking at the root causes of the impact of the fundamental rights and that the simple transparency and explainability uh, does not deal uh, in a proper way with the root causes of negative impact of AI. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. You have put a number of, 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 of issues on, on the floor. Thanks also for picking up my provocation about I mean, being a commercial interest <laughs> to protect personal data subjects' uh, rights. I guess an issue that probably uh, Ricardo, who is the next speaker, will will uh, we might might take uh, up. Still, let me say that uh, a number of other issues remain open uh, related to explainability, personal data protection, and AI. Just provocation by provocation. Uh, one comment. I mean, uh, we are definitely trying to regulate the big players, or at least 
those who are very well equipped in playing with AI, with a number of requirements. There are already questions in the chat. Uh, but let's think for a moment about the ability and possibility for basically small, very free rider, individual persons to develop their own micro AI, just using off the shelf tools which are available. And uh, there is no way that I see right now to uh, to to pin any kind of liability, any li explainability requirement, which is an open floor for uh, for future issues. But uh, uh, let me turn immediately the floor to Ricardo uh, Masucci uh, for uh, a business perspective. We have been provoking quite a lot. Ricardo. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Giovanni. And thanks to, to the distinguished panelists that spoke before me. Uh, it's been it's been really really insightful. Thank you, and and especially let me let me thank the, the privacy hub for the opportunity to to talk today. Uh, as you know, Intel is very glad to support the Leeds project. And back to your initial question: How can we foster legally attentive AI? Uh, an important step is also to to train the the next generation of data scientists, and so. Uh, data scientists that are legally attentive, but also that are tech savvy. So thanks for the work that uh, Scuola Santana and other universities are doing in this in this respect. Probably this is also an opportunity to say that more research, more awareness is needed um, for solving issues like the ones that we are addressing today. Uh, we, we need more awareness, not just for those that are developing AI, but also for those that are using AI. And so what I would like to, to say today, uh, building on uh, comments and intervention made uh, previously, um, I see that, that we are going towards more convergence at international level, thanks to the effort made by the UNESCO and many other international organizations, the European Union, the OECD, the Council of Europe, uh, and others that are trying to build consensus for policymakers and regulators uh, around some values, principles, uh, that should guide uh, our use of uh, artificial intelligence. At the same time, I think it's time also to have more technical convergence on some of the solutions. And so, um, one of the uh, one of the input I would like to to bring to the discussion is also uh, linked to the standardization efforts and more investments that need to be done in the in, in that area. Definitely, I agree. Explainability is critical to make sure that uh, AI is trustworthy. But this is one, one of the elements we need to, to take into account, one of the principles. It has to work in, co in concert with many other principles that were also mentioned by, by Daphna and, and other speakers in their, in their intervention. To, to trust technology, we, uh, we need a, a much broader um, broader spectrum of, of, of elements and we need to, to take into account also the different contexts of use where the, the technology is uh, is used. I like the, the concept of trustworthiness because it's very broad. Uh, it, uh, it, actually, uh, it actually says that a system should meet the expectations of the users and it should in a, in a, ver in a verifiable way. And um, of course, the level of trustworthiness depends a lot on the context of use. It's important also to say that AI is used in contexts that are not human facing. Um, so this has also some implications in terms of risk management. Uh, the concept of trustworthiness includes reliability, resilience, uh, integrity, privacy, cybersecurity, safety, authenticity, and transparency. Uh, another another very important element. Transparency uh, is is key, and and I like the the reference that that was made by um, by Kathleen on 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 the shift of the burden to uh, to the final users, because this is something that probably we saw also in the past. You know, with with consent uh, and, and the notice and and consent model, it's uh, we cannot just rely on on. Uh, uh, on transparency and user control. That was a, a phenomenal instrument, a phenomenal tool for self-determination, for freedom of choice, for uh, for more awareness of uh, of users. But has to be uh, used in concert with with other with other with other principles. And so, um, why AI systems now 
do not seem acceptable from a from a privacy perspective uh, because they may th those autonomous determinations may have an impact on our private lives on our reputation even on our physical condition on our freedom of choice on our self-determination so uh, all the concerns linked to unpredictability of the systems or to the opaqueness of some uh, some AI, AI systems uh, that, that are linked to the lack of the interpretability of the results, right? Uh, th all this can be mitigated with uh, with more transparency. It can be mitigated with more uh, explainability. Transparency gives the great opportunity to have visibility on some of the features, some of the components uh, of of AI systems, and gives us the, the opportunity also to, to challenge the the outcome of those those decisions. Um, Back to my initial input uh, regarding standardization, uh, there is an ISO 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 IEC uh, standard 24028 that describes explainability and, and transparency, and and it's interesting to uh, to see how uh, experts from from around the world came to a common definition of explanation. And there's not one one single explanation. There are ex ante explanations. There are ex post explanations. There are explanations that can bring uh, um that can shed some light on how the system functions and so this is a, a causal explanation there are some epistemic explanations so how do we know the system is going to function how do we know the system function and so the logic link to that and there are some just um, justifications uh, that just uh, justificatory explanations so how um actually on what grounds does that system work so which are the the standards which are the facts uh the the decision is uh, is based on and so uh, with explainability um uh, i'm reiterating what something that was already said by 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 daphne for instance with explainability accountability kicks in so um we need to uh, we need to be accountable what does it mean to be to be accountable to uh, organizations that develop ai systems can also choose which are the models which are the algorithms that go into the ai system because for some uh, context of use for some um, specific applications we need uh, that AI system to be more explainable. We need it to be more understandable. Um, Giovanni, you you mentioned this uh, also. You said it's different to explain something to uh, a trained expert or to a lay person. It's different if the the machine needs to uh, or the outcome of of the of the prediction of the autonomous decision has to be uh, understood by by the physician or by or by the patient. And so, uh, be a, uh, being accountable for an organization that develops uh, AI systems means understanding also which which is the final context of use and which are uh, if if the if AI is used for healthcare, for finance, for employment, for uh, for housing, and those determinations can affect the life of those people. And if sensitive data is involved, if the consequences can be very serious for 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 the reputation for the safety of those uh, of those people well we need a more more explainable uh, algorithms and if there are limitations to the choice of those individuals we need a more explainable algorithms there are some some other um, some other use cases and uh, look for instance at the use of ai in uh, in the industrial yes two minutes in the industrial context um, we can we can all accept for instance uh, a certain degree of mistake. We don't. We don't need to know what happens in the in the black box if we accept that there is a there there is a certain margin of error in selecting a defective product right in uh, on the on the factory on the factory plant. So there are there are specific decisions that that can be can be made because there there are different applications and different degrees of explainability linked to to those applications. So back to um, Back to my uh, initial initial plea, uh, we commend uh, the efforts made at the political regulatory level to build consensus on principle and values to drive uh, the deployment and development of AI. But at the same time, we need uh, 
more standardization and more technical convergence on those solutions that make uh, AI more trustworthy. And those technical standards can also inform uh, those laws and regulations that uh, Director Nemitz and others were, um, were, were mentioning. So uh, with this, more support to uh, initiatives like uh, the subcommittee 42 in ISO IAC, uh, you know, in the, in the standardization organization and, uh, and more, more efforts also through initiatives like LEADS to understand uh, all, the, all the different aspects from a, the legal and technical aspects of, of AI. Thanks a lot for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Ricardo, also for the perfect timing you you, you delivered. And you, you touched uh, already an issue that is uh, emerging in the questions as, um, on, as well. That is, uh, the accountability uh, is tie strictly tied to explainability. We need to be accountable and just to, to use the, the UNESCO expression to the uh, AI operator. AI requires a more diffuse, if you want, accountability because specific moments in the life cycle of the creation and deployment uh, may entail uh, response accountability more than responsibility. So we have to, to pay uh, attention. But I mean, uh, requirements and standardized requirements sometimes may sound uh, as is emerging from the questions uh, uh, in contradiction. So we want to have more explainability, but we definitely want to use uh, privacy preserving uh technologies so this is basically and naturally all leading to you Fosca uh, as uh, as a last but not least speakers at all uh from the research side of explainability and the interplay with personal data protection what's new I would say yeah <laughs> So uh, difficult to speak after all these uh, 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 interventions, which uh, have taken many of the many of the issues which are on the table, on the table so far. So before telling you the story, what the uh, research community is doing uh, so far, l let me say that I, I try to uh, to do the the uh, so to answer <laughs> to your questions, and uh, there is something that I want to say in particular on the fact that. Uh, one of the issues that you mentioned, it can be it can be uh, how foster the, the development of a legally attentive AI. So I strongly believe that, um, so the question which is under the table is not that uh, uh, we are blocking the development and the innovation and the adoption of AI. So, and so I'm, on this, I'm a very strong position. So no trust, no adoption. So. Uh, um, I, I think that from the EI point of view, if we don't get, uh, um, uh, if we don't obtain such trust in the system that we design, we will get again in what is uh, in the in the new EI winter. So I'm talking now from the point of view of the EI uh, EI community, those which are uh, doing research but also doing innovation. It's uh, the uptake of uh, such systems as strongly as strongly uh, uh, based by the trust, the, the trustworthiness that we are that we will be able to equip such such system. And I think that in this sense, as has been mentioned before, the European AI strategy has been quite uh, quite effective. Uh, I think that uh, the, the growing of a, of a uh, research and innovation in trustworthy AI, which we observed in the last three years, even in the, uh, I, I would say, more technical part of this community, the, the, it's, it's really impressive. So there is an enormous effort of the researchers in this area for, uh, for uh, uh, addressing the, the, the topics, which are also very interesting, very interesting uh, scientific challenge, not, not only so. It's not only a matter of, uh, of uh, uh, I would say, societal uh, acceptance of the technology from one side, but also very, very interesting uh, uh, challenge. And I have to say that I am a fan of the uh, EI Act, and, uh, I, and I am aware that it's not only the, 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 unique, the unique law, but in some sense, uh, it, it, has created so much, so much uh, debate huh, within the, the community that uh, uh, activated a, a lot of energies. Uh, uh, and of course, there are there are those those which are always complaining that the, 
the the uh, European industry will lose the advantage with respect to the, the the US or the Chinese one. But then, if you consider what happened with the car manufacturing uh, 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 twenty years ago, when the, there was all the the push towards uh, being more like the catalytic converter, ah, the mani car manufacturing European ones would have failed completely. Now we are moving towards electric cars, so it's so as being a push for the research innovation. So that's I, I want that we are capable of having this this uh, uh, narrative with respect to this uh, uh, push that uh, the Europe is really uh, it's also spreading all over the other the other country. Now, uh, so w w coming coming to the uh, so indeed the XI, what what they are um, observing now is that uh, what, what is the this explainable AI actually is changing AI itself. So it's will be it's the novel. Uh, we are trying to design the novel artificial intelligence, the one that has a that, that um, so XI is a sort of interface uh, between the machine machine and the and the humans uh, trying to activate uh, a sort of a synergic synergic collaboration uh, i use in my in my uh, so to evocating the research that we are doing in, in my project is that the model of this new ai is the model the dr house model and so dr house is a very intelligent agent which collaborates uh, with other very intelligent agents that uh, that uh, contribute, uh, uh, collaborate with him, contribute with new knowledge, and new challenge, and new hypothesis. At the very end, the the decision uh, is in the doctor house. The humans is taking the, the the final decision, but the others are contributing with different uh, with different uh, competences. In terms of uh, uh, scientific vision, what this uh, push towards explainable AI? What is a uh, open this idea of uh, being uh, very close to 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 close the link between fast and low thinking so to be so and this is a, an incredible scientific uh, scientific challenge and as uh, ricardo was saying uh, there is a there is an incredible an incredible uh, production of a uh, of uh, uh, methods methods which are trying to reinvent new methods for machine learning which are transparent natively uh, so the outcome is equipped also with something which is very easy to be understood or there are postdoc explainer there are two very new new uh, new new points uh, awareness in this community that um, uh, uh, apart from all the algorithmic component there is another part so to how to combine this uh, uh, capacity of producing uh, uh, if some format of uh, some explanations with the, the better understanding of the cognitive process, the human cognitive process uh, that uh, the modeling the end user in in the decision making decision making process and combining the the, the two things. So the machine which produces something which can in a format which can be understood by the, the this end user because the machine now knows what is the decision the, and this is really the, the the i mean i would say the frontier of what we are taking now so xi as a as a, a, a really a multidisciplinary multidisciplinary component which is not anymore uh, uh, artificial intelligence it's also cognitive uh, Cognitive and psychological, uh, computational psychology, which are uh, which are combining, and there is another point. So just to te testify that we are just a, a conviction of research so far is that we are just a, at the tip of the iceberg. Is that uh, uh, at the end we have a? It's true we have to to as Ricardo was saying we have to try to to formulate some stand standardization. At least for some of the of the of the uh, uh, methods which can be incorporated in the in AI systems, still there are some research to do, but still there is to find we still to have to find the appropriate validation valid and this is also tackled with the, with the standardization process. What is the appropriate validation process for such system? 
because uh, now so, such systems are human machine systems. Uh, they are such a technical system. And what we can validate is not only anymore the, the standard measures that we have, like accuracy, the, for, the performance measures on the on the on the algorithm. So we need to also to validate uh, the human machine interactions. That means we have to invent uh, new methods like they do in medicine, like trials which involve humans and and uh, try to 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 measure this uh, uh, the, the the social technical system. I have, I'm done now. Uh, uh, just to give you the idea of what well, I mean of the new of the new frontier, the the. Uh, and there is an incredible flourishing of experiments in in health, uh, in in plenty of uh, sectors where we are trying to uh, the, the the community is trying really to 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 experiment the technology in very in very uh, uh, high stakes scenarios, but also uh, getting back some some challenges that are still are still. Uh, on the table by specific uh, specific sectors. So uh, this is just to give you, the, give you an idea of. Thank uh, you, Fosca. Definitely, you were not, not only uh, respect the timing, but they gave a, a lot of insights. And actually, all you have been very, very um, thought provocative because there is an ongoing series of debates already in the chat. So let me pick some of the of the issues in the chat. Uh, meanwhile, eventually someone wants to, to intervene to put on the floor for you. Uh, let me start going a little bit backwards. I mentioned already that has been questioned whether how can we cope with eventual uh, uh, inherent tension among different requirements. Explainability on the one hand and privacy preserving technologies as requirements are one uh, one of them has been uh, uh, rightly mentioned in the in the question, which is open to all of you. How can we cope with that from a technical and and from and and policy making and 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 legal, if you want, point of view? And there is a nice debate that's going on that I'm putting to you the floor to give you the the floor to react. Uh, basically, uh, the question from a tweet. Uh, would you prefer a surgeon with uh, a 90% success rate or a 90% success rate from an AI? Um, before giving you the floor, I would just react on this. Probably the question is uh, not well, not the question, but the tweet. Uh, it's it's not asking the right question because not only there is more uh, in the doctor-patient relationship, but in the AI, there are the, the manifold other issues that go beyond legality uh, also, because uh, I think uh, both Kathleen and Falska um, mentioned that directly it. Um, well, it's probabilistic. Uh, the 90% the success rate, it's not only due to automation. Uh, it may be due to a completely different set of, of, of mm, reasons. Think about the, the, the traditional example of recognizing wolves and ASCIs, which at the very end of the day is done on picture by the algorithm, not for the characteristics, but just from the, 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 the background of the pictures. So what would be your choice, what would be your answer, dear speakers, to the inherent potential tension? Uh, I'm just summarizing some of the questions basically in two big ones, uh, because we have only 13 minutes. How would you solve react to internal tensions between or among different requirements, which are worthwhile anyway? Uh, and uh, what how would you tackle uh, the need to somehow legitimize uh, AI intervention for what they can do of good and how we can use explainability? So who wants to go first? I think Paul is asking the floor. Roughly, you have all of you at uh, two minutes. Okay, so okay then, very quickly, I think many of these alleged uh, contradictions are uh, boogeymen put up by industry lobbyists. They are invented to avoid uh, rights. So let me uh, say one thing about this claim from Eric Schmidt uh, and others that explainability is not a good idea because it will reduce performance. Well, what he's saying is we should go back before enlightenment and accept his technology to be sold, yeah, Google, Microsoft and so on without 
uh, explain uh, explanation and understanding what's actually happening. Well, I would just say let's say no to it. <laughs> I mean, why should we? Why should anybody say yes to that? It's crazy. It's the new god of AI, and you know, we in humanity we have been further than that. Now, let me also say something because I heard that also from Daphne, the alleged contradiction between explainability and privacy. I think it's 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 again a boogeyman. Why? Because of course the explainability is key for the person concerned, and the person concerned will get an explanation of the decision taking in, in relation to him or her based on using his or her data. This is even already part of GDPR. So I mean, you know, is anybody saying that GDPR is contradictory in itself? That's bullshit. Yeah. So I mean, you know, um, let's challenge these claims which are put out there as truth. You know, technically not possible. And let's ask a little bit more precisely before we get into contorted discussions about which then must end in reducing rights. That's what they want. And I'm not playing ball on that. I would say very clearly, nowhere in the public service where public power is exercised, can there be any AI which is not able to be explained or explain and motivate in the, and I'm totally on the line with in Müller on this. And if they can't deliver, finish the business. Let's be clear on this. And this also gives them incentives to put the engineering effort where it belongs in democracy and not maybe where the profit is highest. We have to be tough as crop steel on these points. Thank you, Paul. And I'm pretty sure uh, that you um, there was some con connection problem, but I would add to that that uh, the same rules should not only apply to public decisions, but also to private decisions for a number of reasons we cannot deal with uh, right now. Uh, but I think the next in line asking the floor is uh, Daphna. So you have or even raised your hand. So you have the, your two minutes. Thank you very much. Then thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for the super exciting uh, panel and, and questions. Uh, Paul, I by no means uh, want to reduce and definitely not UNESCO uh, wants to reduce the, the rights. It's exactly the opposite. Everything that we are proposing in the recommendation is that all the mechanisms should be put in place for explainability, transpa transparency, and account. And that's why, as, as Ricardo said, together with uh, liability and accountability to ensure rights. So, by no when if at some point there is any any potential contradiction, it will be just to protect the individual. For for, uh, for for not being exposed in in a, in a, in a way that can harm his his or her rights. That's the only opposition that could be. But it, it's never to protect the industry uh, over the, the the individual. And I want to make this super clear. In fact, uh, all the provisions that are in the recommendation apply for the public, for the private sector. It means that it, it should be it should be also uh, for the industry, but also for governments, because remember that governments are also. And in fact, one of the main things that we are saying is that governments are the ones who have to put in place mechanisms of oversight and also protections like uh, uh, whistleblowers and everyone to make sure that the responsibility that the rights are protected. And I just want to say something else. A part of the explainability, it's about the technicalities, is about who is choosing the mechanisms, why, and they have to explain also how these were uh, how these were uh, uh, developed. For example, one of the things that we have not touched about is the diversity of the teams that are working in developing the, developing these systems, because a lot of biases and problems can come from there. And in fact, we are asking and we are claiming in the recommendation for a very wide and diverse participation of of, uh, of of teams that are developing the, the the algorithms to make sure that everyone's uh, interests are taken into account and that's why we are also uh, asking for a uh, um, these uh, these mechanisms of of uh, 
of establishing or measuring the ethical impact assessment because we want to know how how public is affected and we are also claiming for uh, literacy for people to understand what is happening but not to put the burden on them but to, it's just to make sure that they can protect themselves from uh, the, the the abuses but the, the absolutely the responsibility is for governments for private sectors and for the all AI, AI actors during the whole life cycle development and just a little uh, just a final remark because uh, you started with it at the beginning between ethics and legality I think uh, I agree with you that uh, I agree with what was said that uh, leg legally things could can be accepted that uh, from the ethical point of view cannot but it's more and more that I would really uh, urge not to not to equate ethics to to willingness I mean it's like okay if I want oh, to self-regulation ethics is not about self-regulation ethics is about a constant systematic reflection that accompanies the development of, of science of scientific development and it's also to make sure that because we know that the technology can go as far as it as they can as, as scientists can develop it but we need to have a collective in uh, inclusive multidisciplinary and plural this discussion at, at the at the world level to see what do we want this technology to go what do we want this where do we want this technology to 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 drive us and this is what ethics is about it's not about a code of uh, it's not about my willingness and it's not about a, a set of principles written that it's about the constant reflection so in fact it's not only to challenge some of the legislations but it's also to to maybe create new rights or new legislations that are not in place because we are discovering new challenges to human rights for example so we we will push for new legislation if needed and then the last thing i will say because i know there is more more than two minutes but i cannot uh, i cannot leave without saying it uh, it is something that we need to accompany because even even if we have very good legislation some things cannot be solved only by legal means there will always be a, a need to reflect in when we have legislation in place which one will be better for example so many solutions are not only in 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 the legal and i'm not and in uh, in any way underscoring legislation we are asking for legislation we think that legislation in the digital world is in dire need because we have like a rule of law out of the digital world and we need it in the digital world and i think that the gdp has been and Europe is really taking the lead and we have been collaborating having very good uh, conversations with the EU because we think this is what we need to do this is what we have to push into the rest of the world and I think Europe can push it sorry <laughs> Stop. Thank, you. thank you Daphne wonderful conclusion from from you and uh, just to be to be clear in just advocating that that a, a technology should go unregulated because it's too good it can solve itself it's the work service that we can do to the businesses because that doesn't mean that there is no regulation because you don't have might not have a specific regulation but the general principle general rules apply so that it's a, a, a nice way towards a liability and business the real ones the big ones are free, fully aware of that i guess but i don't take the floor for ricardo fosca was next uh, i beg you all more no more than one and a half minutes so that we we can have uh, by the by new time the the closing okay uh, i will be very short and i'll try to be again to bring again the the, the issues from the the uh, research and the technical point of view who of who tries to operationalize uh, all those ethical principles to be to be incorporated uh, possibly natively in the technology but uh, uh, so we have to be aware of the difficulties no it is not that uh, it's not that simple first question so uh, paul uh, uh, i mean there might be tensions among different ethical principles and in uh, uh, transforming this in something which is uh, uh, the, uh, which is a uh, uh, verifiable or measurable uh, is not is not maybe uh, uh, not easy. In particular, you said about the, about the privacy and uh, and the explanations. There might be there might be tensions. So you might try to 
to uh, generate and, and such tensions are alerts for those which are developing such technology because if you are not aware of the possible tensions you you and you you observe only one only one issues at the time uh, you may you may create some some something which is not uh, uh, not correct for example privacy and transparency and uh, explainability you may provide some uh, some explanation for and such explanations sometimes they are fed by the training set even the way we produce the explanations they are fed by the training set so if you answering to tom i compose an explanations uh, i'm not giving you the law because you are very similar to this other guy that you recognize which is which is a uh, mario so you are revealing that you are violating the privacy of Mario. So this is a, a, a bit complex because it implies also security. So there is a lot of, it's not only generating the explainability, but, but it, it implies also the, the security of the entire architecture, which is behind the system. But you have to be aware that if for explaining to Tom, I reveal something about Sam, there might be so uh, uh, the, so I have to be from technological point of view I have to be very aware about this so and yeah. not so be sure robust against this possibility so that's why uh, there is also this debate it's not because saying we don't want to to so we had to consider even several principles together not only once at the time so that, that's the and it's an interesting challenge I have to admit from the research uh, point of view it's very interesting and secondly, so there was a, 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 a question on the so uh, measuring such measuring such such uh, uh, the quality of the explanation, the quality of the various dimensions, accountability. It, it's one of the issues that are currently on on, on the table of producer technology. There are even too many proposals. That's why we need the standardization because the proposals are some. So, so many, uh, uh, very times uh, strongly depending by, so each one produces a new algorithm and uh, f also proposes new new metrics, but we, uh, now we have to have metrics which uh, are comparable. So, uh, and, and this is the really the issue so that we need to push from standardization. Thank you very so much, I, Fosca. I think I, you completed the, the answering to the questions on the floor. Thanks uh, for, for that. Uh, Definitely yes, uh, Catherine Ricardo. Some final words from from you, Catherine. first. My microphone. Sorry, my microphone. Yes, thank you, Ricardo. Um, I saw some um, uh, just some final words. I saw uh, one remark that that in the chat that triggered me. Someone asking, uh, would a surgeon in an operating room be able to explain why he took all kinds of decisions during his operations? I certainly hope so. I certainly hope that he would be able to do that. Um, so uh, we hear these 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 um, conversation stoppers, if you will. We hear them a lot. People cannot explain themselves. This is simply not true. We can motivate and explain why we do things. Uh, we are not entirely um, uh, entirely simple in that way. Another thing that uh, a conversation stopper that I often hear is, are aren't people also biased? And that is also a conversation stopper that I want to stress here. Of course, people are biased. We, we all are biased. And that is the problem with AI, because all our biased data and information is feeding into the AI. But the difference here, and I want to stress that the difference with AI is, is the scale. What AI does is amplify the biases, is embed the biases of the of the past into the future and is repeating the biases so it's not making our world then more bias free it's just embedding repeating and amplifying these biases and i really want to tackle these conversation stoppers at the end of this um of this uh of this excellent panel thank you for having you me. took my words off my mouth thank you very <laughs> much <laughs> i was going to 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 close the remark with exactly that uh, that point the massive which i was uh, was opening ricardo i have a very quick comment on 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 the question regarding 
uh, homomorphic encryption because I'm, I'm very passionate about privacy enhancing technologies and, and privacy preserving machine learning. Uh, homomorphic encryption together with other uh, techniques now is, is really at the forefront of uh, guaranteeing privacy and security. But back to uh, the reasoning we were doing before, so there are several elements that, that make uh, um, an AI system trustworthy. Uh, if we see that there's a trade-off uh, here with uh, with explainability and transparency, maybe we can pick another privacy enhancing technique uh, like federated learning uh, that protects the, the data sets but allows uh, the members of the federation to have access to the to the model and improve the model and and so have more uh, more visibility on, on the different features uh, of that of that AI system. So all this to say that. Uh, explainability, privacy, security without accountability um, cannot go very far. Thank you very much, Ricardo. I think this panel has uh, uh, demonstrated a number of things. First of all, that uh, it's still worth and definitely it is worth celebrating Privacy Day. So the, <laughs> uh, the Council of Europe was very right in, uh, in, in kicking off uh, this uh, celebration and uh, that in the setting to take all the explainability under the, the the umbrella of the legality attentive data scientist of our project has been a good choice i am really indebted to all the panelists first to the co-organizers of of this uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, meeting very challenging a lot of topics on the floor and i have only one request to uh, all of you let's continue this direction. Let's continue to work together in this uh, direction because it's definitely it's worth, it's challenging, it's interesting, and it's a music. Thank a lot. Thanks a lot. Before we leave, if I can just thank you all on behalf of the Hub and announce that uh, now next step for us will be sustainable AI. So 14th of February, we will have a, our data sustainability event. So we will be in touch about that. Thank you. Oh, okay, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you Thank also you for the much. audience, Bye. for all the insight and inputs from the audience. Thanks a lot. Thank you very Thank you much. much.